Hello everybody on this Wednesday, September 1st, 2010. I'm Spencer Mazik and this is the Bloomberg Law Podcast, a series of interviews focusing on trends in the busy legal profession. Today we want to talk about an issue that has resurfaced in the news of late, and that is physical appearance discrimination. Can employers discriminate against you because of your height, weight, and overall appearance? Joining us in studio to answer that question and many more on the topic is Barbara Hoey. She's a partner at Littler Mendelssohn who concentrates on employment discrimination in age, sex, race, and disability litigation. Welcome, Barbara. It's nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Spencer. So tell me, how does this form of discrimination manifest itself in the work environment? Well, what you'll see when you look at cases is it will be an individual who believes that they were um, not hired for a particular position for which they were qualified, they were denied a promotion, or in some uh, cases they have been actually uh, cautioned or disciplined because of their appearance. I didn't get the job because I'm too fat. I didn't get the job because my boss doesn't think I'm attractive enough. There are also cases, interestingly enough, where managers have been uh, disciplined for refusing to fire people who were perceived to be not good looking enough. Well, with respect to hiring though, is it wrong for employers to hire folks who they find attractive? There is no law, certainly not in New York, there are several states that have specific laws. There's no law that says you cannot choose employees partially based upon how they appear during an interview. But However, you should be choosing people based on their qualifications. Well, so are there laws that outright ban or prohibit employers from discriminating based solely on a person's physical appearance? No, there's okay. no such law, um, specifically on appearance. There are laws that prohibit gender discrimination. There are laws that prohibit disability discrimination. If someone had a disfigurement on their face that was a due to a disabling condition, maybe a skin condition, and you did not hire them because of that skin condition, that person could sue for disability discrimination. Well, so, but are there any local or state initiatives that maybe bar uh, discrimination based on physical appearance or height or weight? Uh, I know that Michigan has had a statute on a record. Michigan for has a statute, DC has a statute, there's a uh, town in California that has a statute, but um, there is no federal law okay. across the board. But there are individual federal laws that I think feed into these theories, like New York, and now there's also a federal act, prohibits discrimination based upon genetic characteristics. Could with, someone... res with respect to the local jurisdictions, sure. I know that they include Howard County, Maryland, San Francisco, and Santa Cruz, California, Santa Cruz, right. Mad Madison, Wisconsin, and Urbana, Illinois. But speaking of the Michigan statute, though, uh, I guess, aren't there a couple cases now that are pending in the state brought against tutors uh, by former waitresses who are alleging weight discrimination? Yeah, these are women who claim that Hooters uh, was disciplining them because they didn't satisfy Hooters weight requirements, which frankly um, are, if, if their claims are true, the weight requirements are quite stringent. Like, when I read something about there being a weight probation period, what's that all about? There was, there's a woman who's claiming that she was put on weight probation because she was deemed to be overweight. And by no stretch of the imagination did the figures, her actual weight figures, deem her to be overweight. Under Hooter's standards, she's claiming that they claimed she was overweight. The weight probation, she felt, um, was humiliating, um, embarrassing. She had people calling her and coworkers making comments. According to the, the charges, um, Hooters has, I think, three sizes of uniforms, extra small, petite small, and small. You yeah, know? I remember that. <laughs> you know, there's no... Uh, medium or large or medium extra or large. large. Well, so where are these cases now? The cases, and I, I think there's only one or two cases, um, are just at the very beginning. There have been some initial motions, but there's certainly been no finding that Hooters did anything unlawful. And so then that's pursuant to the Michigan statute. And like we said, yes. there are other local initiatives. But to be clear, there is no federal law that spells out protection from discrimination for the aesthetically challenged. That's true. That is true. And might certain persons with certain characteristics, like you said, weight and facial disfigurement, might they find uh, some federal protection against workplace discrimination under the Americans with Disability Act of 1990? 
It's possible. However, it's recognized that weight and being, quote, uh, just overweight is not in and of itself a disability. Okay, Morbid well, obesity is a disability. Before we get to how okay. it may be covered, can you mm -hmm. just tell us what the ADA is? What was it sort of designed to accomplish? Well, the ADA prohibits discrimination against an individual who has a disability, who is otherwise qualified for the job, and the statute says, and then with or without some accommodation might be able to perform the job. So a qualified individual with a disability Correct. means what? Well, in order to have a disability under the ADA, which was amended in 2008 to expand the definition of a disability, you have to have some sort of a physical impairment which substantially limits you in one or more of your daily life activities. It's a wide range of impairments. It can be anything from a, like a diabetes, it covers learning disabilities, it covers physical impairments of the limbs, it covers heart condition, it covers mental disabilities. It's okay. a wide range of impairments. And we should note that impairments do not include physical characteristics like hair color, eye color, left-handedness, or even height, weight, and muscle tone within normal ranges that are not connected to a physiological disorder. That's absolutely correct. But it does, case law seems to indicate that morbidly obese might find some protection under the ADA. And with that, I want to talk about the case of Cook versus Rhode Island Department of Mental Health. Can you tell us about this case? Well, in this Cook case, uh, the plaintiff's name was, I think, Deborah Cook, and she applied for a position. She was qualified for the position. She was very heavy. She was 5'2 and weighed 320 pounds. And I believe that it does meet the definition of morbidly obese. She was denied the position, and the department was very open about saying they were not giving her the job because of her weight. When I understand that um, even though she passed the physical, they, feel, they felt that maybe she couldn't evacuate folks in the case of an emergency, and then also that she was at greater risk for weight-related ailments, correct? That's correct. However, there was no showing that she wasn't qualified for the basic job. And another issue that came up during the, during the course of the case was that the job in and of itself was not a physically demanding job. It was not, you know, she wasn't climbing trees or climbing ladders. It was basically a, a counselor type position. So she challenged it. You and, know, and what did the court hold here? She ended up winning. Oh, and really? she ended up winning on the theory that even if she wasn't disabled, there's another, def there's another s provision of the ADA which protects you based on perceived disability. Yeah, I was going to ask, doesn't the ADA protect those folks who are regarded as disabled? Right. So there, doesn't even need, there only needs to be the perception that the obesity is related to a physiological disorder. Right. And what she said was, look, maybe I'm not disabled, but they clearly think I am because they're refusing to hire me for a job for which I'm otherwise qualified. And in the end, the court um, really uh, sort of, I think, slammed it at the end by saying, um, in a society that all too often confuses slim with beautiful or good, morbid obesity can present formidable barriers to employment, whereas here the barriers trans transgress federal law, those who erect and seek to preserve them must suffer the consequences. Well, and don't courts generally, though, reject obesity as an impairment or, or disability because they want it to be connected to a physiological disorder? But what's the concern here? Why is there this need for it to be connected to a physiological disorder? Because of the definition in the, the statute. I mean, the statute doesn't define obesity in and of itself as being an impairment. It has to be obesity. I think of the more, quote, morbid obesity is defined as an impairment, but if you just are obese, but you don't have some other physiological disorder, you may not have a claim. What mm -hmm. I have found is most people who at some point are obese or have a weight problem will have other physiological disorders. They might have a type 2 diabetes, they might have heart disease, they might have other cardiovascular problems, they might have high blood pressure. So they will there, be able to... Is there a to... concern though about uh, protecting a mutable characteristic, anything that can change? Is that, is that a concern of the court? Yes, or and that is, that is an issue that commentators are wrestling with as different states and jurisdictions are considering these appearance laws. Are we protecting people who could change their situation? However, the ADA protects illnesses like um, AIDS. It protects cancer that you might get from cigarette smoking. It protects um, 
diabetes, which may or may not be related to eating habits, exercise. So it, it is a little bit of a double standard to say we're not going to protect someone who's obese, but we are going to protect someone who smokes cigarettes mm -hmm. and, and developed cancer. And that's what the commentators on the other side are saying. I'm not, I don't know who's right, mm -hmm. but certainly it's a question about whether or not people who have weight problems are being treated fairly, as opposed to people who have other kinds of physiological problems. Okay, well, I want to move on and talk about facial disfigurement under the sure. ADA. And with that, I'd like to discuss the case of Talanda versus KFC National Management Company. In this case, Talanda hires an employee who's missing several teeth to work the front counter at a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant. Talanda's supervisor sees the employee, and he doesn't think this is an appetizing situation for customers, and asks Talanda to remove the employee from working the front counter. Talanda refuses to do so because she thinks this is morally and legally wrong. And so she, in turn, is fired. She initiates an action against the company. And tell us, did Talanda find protection under the ADA? No, Talanda did not win in the end. And what the court found, and I think where she ran into a difficulty was on a, on a couple of levels. In order to prove retaliation, and that's what she was trying to claim, retaliation, you have to prove that what you were complaining about was something that was protected under the law, that it was protected activity. Um, the employee who she was protecting did not herself claim to be disabled. She said, I'm fine. She did have a, uh, a severe dental problem, I think is how they put it with her missing teeth. But she didn't claim to be disabled. She didn't claim that she couldn't do the job. She also was not really protesting the move to the back. The employee who she was protecting said, I don't mind working in the back. So what the court held, though, was that Talanda simply did not have a legitimate right to complain and that it was not protected activity under the law, and she lost. Um, and the court did note, though, that they are not going to foreclose future facial disfigurement cases from being covered under the ADA. In fact, it said, we do not mean to imply that facial disfigurement, including facial disfigurement caused by dental problems, can never be a disability for the purposes of the ADA. In addition to the ADA, though, might someone who's experiencing physical appearance discrimination also seek refuge under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act? Yeah, of course. I mean, many times these claims are linked to gender claims. And I don't know if you're familiar with the sex plus or gender plus standard. No, I'm not. What is that? Gender plus means I'm claiming discrimination based on my gender plus something else. Yeah, and I wanted to give you an example. Say, for instance, if a female flight attendant who is asked to weigh 15 to 25 pounds less than her male colleagues of the same height and age, might she have a viable claim based on sex discrimination um, under the Title VII? She might if she could show that men were not being held to the same standards. So weight policies that treat men and women disproportionately then, are they facially discriminatory? That, that would not be appropriate. And that, um, I think there was a case that we, we, would, that we talked about yeah, that I wanna, dealt with I that. I want to talk about a case where uh, the woman wasn't able to prove that there was a different weight standard applied to men. And that is the case of Marx versus National Communication Association. What are the facts here? Well, Ms. Marks was um, overweight. I think she weighed in excess of 200 pounds. She worked in a telemarketing job, and she applied for a job as an outside sales representative, which would have been more lucrative. I think she would have had a greater opportunity for commissions. She was denied the job. And again, her managers were pretty open about telling her, well, you can have the job if you lose the weight. I yeah, think that was one of the weight, lose the weight, get, get the job. Exactly. Lose the weight, get the job. And then they promoted another young lady who had less experience. And I think Ms. Marks had been the telemarketer of the year hmm. before she applied for this position. So again, qualifications, not a question, kind of like with Ms. Cook. Mm -hmm. um, they promoted someone who had less experience, who, th who was not the telemarketer of the year, who was cute and thin. That thinner, was, at least thinner and cuter than Ms. Marks was. Yes. And um, she then proceeded to complain internally to coworkers and other managers. Over time, I think things got very uncomfortable for her. She ended up getting suspended and ultimately fired. So again, though, uh, summary judgment for the employer here, and is it because she yeah. wasn't able to prove that there was a different weight standard for men versus women? Exactly. What the court held was the, the defendant put in evidence that we do not have any 
overweight outside sales representatives. Our men and women are expected to be in, quote, a normal weight range. She had no proof that there were overweight men. And there was some debate in the uh, deposition about her saying, I saw some overweight men walking around. I couldn't identify them. Honestly, some of that result has to do with how her lawyer litigated the case. Mm -hmm. I think if he had, they had sought specific information about the weight of other people in that job class, right. she might have won that motion. You know, it's not always about the law as much as how did they go about proving and maybe where did they not, where did they fail in their proof. She had no proof that there were overweight men in the job that she was looking for. So discrimination based solely on weight alone not is enough. not enough to violate Title VII. She had to prove that there were men who were not subject to, the, to weight standards. And she didn't do that, and she lost. And that's where you get into gender plus. Mm -hmm. She was saying it was not just my gender, it was my gender plus weight. Well, and I want to move on and talk about the level of attractiveness. Might employment decisions based on the lack of attractiveness implicate Title VII? I think that is possible. Um, it's going to be difficult to prove unless you have, if you have objective proof that you and the person next to you had the same qualifications, you were better qualified, um, you should have gotten this position or you were denied the promotion like Ms. Marks, um, if it's a man versus a woman, if it's uh, two different protected categories, you have a claim. If it's two equal people, I don't know that you're going to be able to say it was simply my appearance and make out a claim. Certainly there's no law now mm -hmm. that would say they didn't hire me because I'm, quote, not attractive. Um, I think one of the other issues is there's a thought that people don't want to come out and say that. You right, know, of course. Who wants to go into a court and say, I'm not attractive. Right. Nobody no, wants to say that. Um, no, you're absolutely right. And, and, and well, one case, though, and then the last case that I want to talk about today is the case of Yanowitz versus L'Oreal USA, Inc. In this case, Yanowitz is a regional sales manager who's asked to do what? It was actually sim somewhat similar to that Talanda case. Um, a manager, although not as, uh, not as blatant, a manager at L'Oreal apparently saw a sales associate and said to Yanowitz, you know what, I want you to fire her. I mean, he even says, get me somebody hot. I, I think he comes onto the sales floor and points to another woman who he finds sufficiently attractive and says, get me one that looks like that. Right, it, exactly. It, incredible. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's unfortunate, but look, there are people like that everywhere and, and you just have to, uh, employers have to be careful to hopefully train them to be a little more sensitive. Um, Yanowitz uh, refused and um, in, in that case, however, Yanowitz had a, came out with a better result. Now, maybe that was because, you know, she was in California, mm -hmm. which, which... But the, what was the result here? Well, she had a claim. I mean, she had a claim that she had been retaliated against. And again, it was partly that L'Oreal, one of the things they noted was L'Oreal did not have any policy that stated that its sales associates should be attractive. Yeah, but did they, did Yanowitz prove that there was a different beauty standard for men versus women? No, she didn't expressly prove that. She just was able to prove that she was being retaliated against for protesting it. Well, I mean, well, so how do you reconcile, I guess, the decision in Yanowitz with the decision in Marx? I mean, I know that you mentioned maybe because it's in California, so that might be a difference, but why are there different outcomes when neither party was able to prove that there was a different standard applied to men versus women? I think because, I mean, some of it has to do with, with the specific facts and with the, with the way it was being litigated. And in, and in Yanowitz's case, when you're talking about California, I think the courts in California are somewhat more receptive to these claims. Well, then also with Yanowitz, is it um, that that was more of a retaliation claim? Is, yes. that as a, is that a lower standard or a lesser standard? Because with Marx, I know that she was bringing the claim based on herself, um, but it, is, would that be... Yes, it's, it, is a, it is a somewhat different standard okay. with Ms. Yanowitz. Well, and there are a lot of people out there now who seem to be calling for a ban on physical appearance discrimination. In fact, in her new book, The Beauty Bias, Deborah Rode, who is a Stanford Law School professor, seems to be advocating for a federal ban on appearance-based discrimination. Do you think that the aesthetically challenged should be a protected class? Frankly, and I do come, come to this with somewhat of a management bias because I counsel and represent 
employers. That's what I do. Um, I think we have enough protected classes um, <laughs> in, um, in New York alone. Um, I think we have 15 categories of, of uh, people who are protected from discrimination, starting with age and race and then moving on to that you cannot discriminate against people because of criminal convictions. Mm -hmm. um, so I think to add a very broad, ambiguous appearance-based discrimination will open the door to additional, and in some cases, frivolous claims um, by people who, for whatever reason, can't find some other protected class to sue under and then decide, well, it must have been, if it was nothing else, it must have been my appearance. Mm -hmm. And how do you define What's How does attractive? anyone define what's attractive? You know, what's attractive to to person A might be unattractive to person B. So then you also get into, is the law meant to right every wrong in society? Is the law meant to make everything fair? I mean, we are not all the same. And some of us will succeed in certain jobs because we're smarter. Some of us succeed in certain jobs because we're better at math. Some of us succeed because we're better at Red or writers, we all have different strengths and weaknesses. That's what makes us different. I don't think the law was meant to equalize everyone. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about prohibiting discrimination, aren't you really talking about prohibiting employers from making decisions based on um, who they might want to work with, who they might think is going to do well at their company? There are a lot of subjective things that go into a hiring decision that are perfectly lawful. Mm -hmm. and makes sense. Um, and it's very difficult for clients as it is when, when they're making hiring decisions because they have to be concerned with so many different legal protections and making sure they don't run afoul of the legal protections. And honestly, most of my clients do work very hard to make the right decision, to hire the right person, a person who's qualified. But then when qualifications are equal or somewhat equal, you're making decisions based on some subjective factors. Well, and I understand what you're saying, but it certainly is a worthy goal to have folks judge purely on their contribution to the workplace rather than their appearance, wouldn't you say so? Absolutely. And I don't think anyone, I certainly, when I make hiring decisions and interview, we're interviewing right now for a new attorney, I'm not judging people based on physical attractiveness. I'm judging people based on what I perceive, um, how well they will do their law school background, et cetera. Um, it is a laudable goal. I just don't think we need federal legislation at this point to address it because I think the existing legislation we have protects people from the most egregious kinds of discrimination. All right. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. I feel like we've only really just scratched the surface on this topic, and there's so much more to discuss, so perhaps we'll have you back for a part two on the issue. But sure. thank you for sharing your insight with us today. We appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me, Spencer. Excuse me. When we come back, our spotlight on contributed content. Back in a moment. Digital technology has transformed the way we live our lives. We can access any piece of information at any time from anywhere. We can share ideas with thousands of people instantly. Staying up to date with breaking news and events is easier now than ever before. All this lets us keep pace with the world in real time. Yet, have any of these innovations been applied to the way we research and practice law? Starting today, the answer is yes. Welcome to Bloomberg Law, the first and only real-time research system for the 21st century legal practice. Created by the leading provider of data and information services. A single search feature with access to legal, news, and company databases provides you with powerful legal research results and a holistic view of your clients, filtered so you know the information you receive will be relevant every time. Customizable legal, financial, and news alerts keep you ahead of your clients and in tune with their world. An integrated workspace allows you to organize your results by client, by urgency, by topic, however you want it, and to share those results with people on your team. Log in now to experience Bloomberg Law. Now it's time for our Spotlight on Contributed Content. This is a segment where we highlight an article that was featured in one of our Bloomberg Law reports. Today's article comes to us from Regina Petty of Fisher & Phillips. The title of the article is, The EEOC's Recent Agenda on Work-Faith Conflicts. 
In the article, the author discusses the commission's enforcement of religious accommodation in the workplace and provides best practices for employers to reduce the risk of religious-based claims. This is an interesting read, and you can find this article in the August 2nd issue of our Bloomberg Law Reports, Labor and Employment on the Terminal at LELRGO or at BloombergLaw.com. Articles are contributed to us for publication by practitioners, law professors, and other legal experts. To find out more about how you can contribute, please visit BloombergLaw.com. A special thank you to Regina Petty for that contributed piece. And again, our thanks to Barbara Hoey of Littler Mendelssohn. Bye, everybody.